All right. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Uh, happy to close us out for Lightning Talks today, and then we can move on to a break before the keynote. It should be exciting. Uh, as announced, I'm Michael Fagan. I work as a computer scientist with the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in the United States. Some folks may know who we are in the room, but for those who don't, our mission is to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness. We're in the Department of Commerce, so we have a little bit of a uh, commerce-oriented tilt. We have a lot of uh, work in some general scientific areas, uh, including physical measurement science, and uh, the work I do is in the information technology lab, uh, more specific to more traditional computer science or, in my case, uh, applied cybersecurity. We have two main campuses, one in Boulder, Colorado, which uh, interestingly houses the uh, atomic clock, and there's a, a, a bunch of both communications research and uh, nuclear research that go on there. And then our main campus is in Gaithersburg, Maryland, outside of Washington, DC. So what I'm here to talk about today is some new work our team is trying to kick off, or at least start to think about that we feel would be, uh, we at least are looking for the input from the soups community in general and from folks in the usable uh, security field overall. So um, anyone in the room who's interested at the end of this talk, feel find me, uh, get my card, let us know, go to our website. And then any of your colleagues that you know that may be interested in this work, um, please put us in touch. So a lot of the stuff we hear about today uh, in the talks and overall is about making cybersecurity more usable inherently. Just you use it, it's better, it's easier. You don't actually have to talk to anyone about it. It just you make the better choice more naturally. But that's not can't always be the case in a complex supply chain. When you think about uh, beyond the end user, going further and further back into the supply chain, transparency is really important to establish requirements. Beyond that, expectations. And then to, if you're looking at it from a life cycle standpoint, uh, to create that feedback loop of understanding what issues have come up and fixing them. We actually heard that kind of come up in a talk today about, uh, basically it got me thinking about expanding ticketing beyond just, uh, oh, there's a, a root issue, it's just this is annoying. So maybe uh, the IT staff can find out what's more annoying. Um, but different kinds of communications have different sorts of implications. And I think it's not lost in this community that what's appropriate for one kind of user or one group is not going to be appropriate for all users in all groups. That said, transparency is becoming a, a hot topic beyond just me standing here talking to you about it today. There are a number of external drivers that really brought us to thinking about this. Executive Order 14028 here in the United States a couple of years ago as well as Singapore's Cybersecurity Agency's Cybersecurity Labeling Scheme, commonly known as CLS, are both examples of product cybersecurity labeling, mostly targeted IoT products. That's really where my background is at NIST, so a lot of the work you'll hear talk about is kind of phased in that area, but of course this is not the only area that we see cybersecurity transparency um, coming up. In addition to that, you see the medical, in medical device space, both through um, by extension, the EU uh, Cyber Resilience Act, which mentions medical devices, but is preempted by existing uh, regulation in Europe. Uh, but here in the United States, uh, Section 524B of the US Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, talks about cybersecurity for metal devices and notably talks about software bills and material. Now, of course, a cybersecurity label meant for an end consumer is a lot different than a software bill of material. I'm just going to stop right there. But that's just to really show you the kinds of the, the breadth we're trying to think about when we say cybersecurity transparency. It can be to the end user. A label might be appropriate. It can be to another organization like a hospital where the depth of knowledge that's reflected in a, cyber, in a software bill of material or some other uh, lengthy cybersecurity disclosure would be more useful and not just completely useless. But that's more, uh, I guess, those demonstrate traditional just give me information, thank you. Uh, and I'll make my decision based on it. But there's also another way transparency can happen that we're thinking about, which uh, I'd say is reflected a bit more in the uh, EU Cyber Resilience Act and the Radio Equipment Directive also out of Europe, um, that is talking more not so much about, I mean, you have to tell somebody something, but it's not the general public necessarily. Uh, in this case, it's maybe built on a conformity assessment mechanism, a laboratory, uh, another agency might look at the information that a in this case, a manufacturer would provide, um, and they would say, yes, that, that, that meets the requirements in this case. Uh, so not, you know, it wouldn't necessarily go out to the end user, but it still may be very valuable. So we have some initial, so just to, I'm going to talk over this last one here. So our initial ideas, right, some of the things that are important are the audience is what you have to focus on, who you're talking to, and what kind of information you want to deliver to them. On top of that, uh, what kind of mode of communication is going to be most appropriate? I've covered a few today, and you know, we know that not all are appropriate in all cases, though sometimes things like SBOM come up in certain instances where it 
doesn't quite make sense for the context. It's just sort of a hot button issue. I'm sure anyone in the audience could note other ones just like that. And this idea is to try to take all of that knowledge, all of the good research that comes out of soups and elsewhere, and funnel it into at least the start of organizing that understanding in a broader way so organizations can approach this more consistently and kind of create a, you know, a feedback loop even in the community on it. So I'm out of time. So if you have any questions or would like to find out more information, uh, reach me out or you can go to our website or email us uh, here on the slides. And I'm happy to talk more. Thank you for the time, everyone. Awesome, thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the audience? I'll uh, kick off by asking you, in your opinion, what do you think should be the responsibility of the vendors of IoT devices for ensuring transparency and communication of privacy requirements? Uh, so of privacy or of oh, requirements? Oh, sorry. Or just so it's opinion. a complicated, so okay. So the transparency and the communication uh, responsibility of any, part of this is understanding what that is of any party. So in a situation where it's a manufacturer going downstream and communicating something to end consumers, there's an asymmetrical relationship with the amount of information they have and what they can even do with that information. I, as a customer, may not have a choice at the store. You, as a manufacturer, could pick a different vendor, maybe. Um, but going upstream, it gets more complicated when you say requirements, and that's where I mentioned expectations as well. It might not even get to the point of requirements. It's just, hey, this is what the chips can do. You guys can figure out how to use that in some innovative way. Uh, which might have cybersecurity expectations or, ex or implications embedded in it that downstream, I think it came up today like OT, you know, in IoT we deal with this. An OT manufacturer or somebody with a traditional or a manufacturing organization with a traditional OT background might, might need that expectation laid out clearly to them because of the culture differences. They might, you know, uh, silicone manufacturers might say, oh, yeah, of course you think about X, but somebody using silicone to make a crane doesn't think about X. I think we have another question. Mm -hmm. Lori, please go ahead. Hi, Lori Craner, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I've been working on IoT labels for a while. I'd love to talk with you more about mm -hmm. them. Um, in some of my discussions with uh, industry people, when they are thinking cybersecurity, or yeah, cybersecurity labels, they're emphasizing security. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about it, I also talk about privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, what does NIST mean? Do you mean both or just security? In the context of this, we're talking about it in relation to cybersecurity, since that's where my background is. And within the Applied Cybersecurity Division, we do have the Privacy Engineering Framework team, sort of separate. So at the same time, when I say that, uh, I think, like you say, especially for an end user or for uh, an organization or a group that is, so OT might be like that too, I don't know, I'm just guessing, right? They might in mix these thoughts because they're bringing their own lay knowledge into how they might understand cybersecurity. That's why I say that, I don't know for sure, I haven't done the research. But when that's happening, um, and even when there isn't a formal separation, the idea of communicating about something uh, like cybersecurity or privacy, um, I think touches on similar concepts. When you get down to the end of the day, the mode, I can't say much about that based on what your expectations are around privacy, and, and that's where we would be working with the privacy community in addition to the cybersecurity community to make sure we're understanding that. But uh, I think at a theoretical level, I. At, right at this stage, I can't hypothesize there being significant difference in the kinds of considerations that get made. So we, we have it on our minds, but we always have to do this dance since the way it's separated in, in our division at NIST, uh, we don't have any particular uh, control over privacy in that regard, even in the IoT space. Um, so I can't say anything in what we would do regarding communication of privacy, but uh, the rest of my comments, I think, still stand as an expert in the area. Okay, I'd love to talk to you more yeah, about Yeah, happy to talk more. Great, thanks so much, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, give a round of applause to Michael.